All right, we have a number of questions. Where are we going to get, who's going to go first? All right. The um, question for Dr. Shapira, um, and it's actually a question for three of you doctors, Dr. Shapira, Dr. Granzel, and Dr. Amron. I will let Dr. Shapira go first. Does patient age and size impact how well the skin will retract after surgery? I'm sure it does. The older we get, our ability to generate, to synthesize uh, collagen and elastic tissue uh, goes down. Um, but I can say that um, I was impressed how much skin contraction you have, a patient have actually quite shortly after one procedure. Um, and that includes, I think, I, I two ladies at the 73 and 74 years old who underwent one procedure, and really the skin contracted very well. Whether I can compare to the younger patient, I believe it. Younger patients get better results. So yes, as we age, or there's a larger size, you're affecting the skin elasticity. But generally, the, the, the more elastic skin is going to tend to retract better uh, with liposuction. But then a big part of liposuction is how you deal with that skin from underneath. Um, regardless of what tools you use in the superficial component of things to get that skin to do what you want it to do. When you're dealing with gravitationally prone areas such as the arms, you are reducing weight that's dragging the tissue down, and that's one reason why the tissue will naturally tend to recoil to a certain degree, and then it's knowing how to deal with that skin from underneath in a way to get that skin to retract in an even sheet with things. Um, I do feel that certain devices can help with it. I don't want you to think that it's the end all be all things like vaser and laser, because quite honestly, some of my best results have come from just mechanical liposuction where the skin is dealt properly from underneath. But generally, yes, as we age, we reduce elasticity, and that reduces the ability of the skin to retract. Who's the, who's the other person you wanted? Who was the other? There's a third person, right? right? Oh, Yeah, so. Uh, definitely, the younger a patient is, and the more uh, or more elastic their skin is, the better they'll do. The caveat here too is if there if there's a lymphedema component in the patient, or they have lymphedema, it'll retract 100% no matter who that patient is, which is very interesting. And I th and I think that's due because due to the inflammatory nature of the lymphedema, and it's like radiated skin that that just goes down. But we've never had an issue with that. If you don't have a lymphedema component, then yes, age and um, I think age and skin elasticity and then also genetics are, are very important and they're all variables and they'll, they'll change from patient to patient. Next question is for Mindy. Mindy, can people email you <laughs> to get some more information if they have questions um, about the appeals process? Yes, I put my email on the front page of the uh, handout, so yes, I will answer emails. Okay. This is a burning question, and I think we're going to present this to all of the surgeons, and we'll start with you, Dr. Granzel, since you're right here next to me. How is the liposuction truly lymph sparing when the smaller lymph vessels are intertwined with the connective tissues, blood vessels, and fat? That's an excellent question, and I can say that it, it just it depends on how it's done. And Well, there are a lot of technical ways that that's done, but bottom, simplifying that out, if you use a blunt tip cannula, the cannula will tend to push the lymphatics or the, 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 the fixed structures such, such as the blood vessels and the lymphatics out of the way. The fat cells tend not to be able to get out of the way as well, and so they tend to be aspirated. Um, there are a lot of small details in, in each of the parts of the technique, but long story short, I think that's how it works. Uh, again, we see that the, once the fat comes out, especially when there's in a, in a patient with a heavier, thicker patient, the, the lymphatic drainage actually gets better in that them just consistently too, so. Um, I, I actually agree. So, and I think the other things you have to see also is the different types of patients. I think some people are thicker, some people aren't, and there's different tools that we use. And, and Dr. Amron actually touched on most of them. We have a, a lot of different tools, and not every one, not every tool is right for that person, and, and vice versa. Um, we do try to use things initially to try to separate as much of the area as possible. Obviously, it's a mess in fluids, separates things out. 
Um, the vaser does actually um, cavitate things and separate things out. Wall does that too. So there, there's a lot of different tools that we use to also try to spare as much vasculature as possible. And then from the, when I, in my talk, what I talked about too is we, we try to do things in a, in a longitudinal fashion. As much as you're going with, the, you know, parallel to the lymphatic. So th that's another goal. That's another thing also. So I think we try to do everything we can. Huh, that's a good question. Um, you know, the term lymphatic sparing, I, I think it was a couple years ago, three years ago in New York, I challenged what that term really meant. Of course, it means sparing lymphatics, but, but what technically translates into that, and is it any one particular thing? Um, just because you do it under local versus general anesthesia, are you being lymphatic sparing? Just because you're using wall versus something else, are you being lymphatic sparing? I think mean, Stutz said it very well. These are all basically long metal wands that you're using under the skin to get your endpoint with things. Um, to me, I, 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 and I, I said this years ago, and I still feel this after um, a lot, 1,300 surgeries, that um, it's where you are primarily and staying in that subcutaneous layer of fat that is a safe lymphatic plane. If you transverse, if, if you, if you uh, traverse into the deeper areas, you get into the deeper lymphatic branches and trunks and damage those things, to me, that is what really is lymphatic damaging. So you could use a wall under local anesthesia and poke through and damage something deeper and cause deeper lymphatic damage. Um, I then also would say that if you're being very aggressive um, by whatever device, I mean, people have said the laser is going to damage superficial lymphatics, then every patient, lip, lipidema or not, would have lymphatic damage and problems after high definition liposuction or something like that. So to me, really, it means where you're staying in that plane. And that is truly lymphatic sparing. Couple, couple of points. Um, number one, I think, uh, beside the lay, I think everything is correct. You have to be really gently. Um, and actually, when I watch my mentor in Germany, um, we compare to how you play the violin. In other words, you don't push it like that, but you like play the violin because obviously if you meet resistance, you have to back up and avoid it. And so I think that's the key is to stay in the layer, be longitudinal, because if you come across lymphatics, you're more likely to damage it than if you come parallel to it. It's just intuitively very clear. If I may regress for one second to the prior question about the age and retraction, I think the key is, is to wear the compression after that. I think that's the key to good and even retraction after surgery. I think it's much more important than age. I think you can get it in any age. It may take longer, but I think that's the key. Okay. Well, I, I have little to add. I agree with everything that was said before. Um, I, I think you know all all effort should be made to spare lymphatics. Though I I think some terminal lymphatics do get damaged in the course of even the most careful um, uh, lymph sparing liposuction. And and so I, I think um, the you know all efforts. The post-operative care is is uh, so important to, for the final outcome, and, and and making sure that there is the manual lymph drainage and the compression. I have a couple of things to add. First of all, this is not that traumatic type of liposuction that you see on YouTube. It's a very gentle kind of liposuction. In addition, Dr. Stutz did a study several years ago, and he looked at aspirates after liposuction and found no lymphatics in it. Did we? Okay, we got everybody. So piggybacking on that, um, Dr. Schwartz, does the removal of excess skin after liposuction damage the lymphatics? Uh, that, I was trying to, that was one of the points I was actually trying to make. Um, so the lymphatic, our lymphatics are in many different layers. And uh, there was one slide that was my favorite that really showed when we looked at the abdominal wall and that actually translates to the rest of the body. There are lymphatics in the, in the skin, there are lymphatics in the deeper, in the superficial fascia, and then there is deep lymphatics. So um, 
removing the skin, it depends on how aggressive and where you're trying to take it from. When we find that if you just take it, if you leave the superficial fascia behind and remove that top layer, which is also layer your liposuctioning, you're actually going to leave a lot of lymphatics behind, especially the deeper trunks and the deeper areas, which are probably going to be your better areas of collection too. Um, the last thing I talked about was that the deepithelialization, where we literally just take the color portion of your skin is the epidermis, the underneath portion is the dermis, the collagen portion. We can actually just take the epidermis off and leave everything else behind and close over that and actually leave everything. So uh, I think it's different for different people, but when we try to look at these procedures, when I look at a, a thigh lift or an arm lift or even a, a tummy tuck versus one of my cosmetic patients, we, we try to do it a little more, uh, a little more careful and more sparing. Um, to make sure we leave as much behind. Dr. Wright, what device or devices do you use and why? Well, I, I, um, so I do both uh, power-assisted lipo and water-assisted lipo, and um, I, I like them both, and, and, uh, and again, like Polly said, it's, it's more the hand that holds the tool than the tool itself. Um, and I think the other, the other surgeons have also, you know, remarked on that. Okay. This question is for all of the surgeons, and Dr. Bird, we'll start with you. Can you share um, your weight limits for surgery? Usually, I go for around the 300-pound range. Um, I like to work with ladies that are over that, and even at that range, to try to get their weight down somewhat before we do the surgery, but um, you know, everybody's a little different and I'll look at everybody individually to make the decision. Yeah, if I had to put a number, I, I, I'm somewhere around 350 is when I start to really have um, uh, concerns, um, but uh, just like di Dr. Bird, um, you know, try to, try to work with, with uh, larger, larger ladies um, and uh, focus more on conservative met, met, methods. I think it's a very difficult question, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I have a good answer. Um, in our website, we say we don't discriminate against high BMI. And that's partially true, but it is a problem because, as uh, we heard before, the risk of surgery is definitely of complication is higher with the heavier patients. So I think number one is really to optimize weight loss, diet, decongestion, optimize it, optimize it. And if it takes half a year, takes a year, let it be. But then patients present a lower risk. Then the other question is, of course, you don't have to go, if a patient comes with a, you know, 200 pounds, you know, then you can address <clears throat> different parts of the body. You can address the legs, the thighs, the buttocks, the hips, the upper arms. But if patients come very heavy, I'm considering that two patients are very heavy, but just to do a limited procedure at the areas that are most limiting them from their mobility and for ability to move and to lose weight. Because these women are caught. They cannot lose weight because they cannot move. So they cannot move, I mean, it's just vicious cycle. So I think sometimes you should, should take kind of a more individual approach and address the most limiting and more critical area, most critical areas, and then continue maybe stage by stage. And the last comment I want to ask, maybe the plastic surgeons in the panel, it crossed my mind, I never have done it, but maybe some patients should undergo paniculectomy prior to procedure. Because this panel, sometimes it weighs 50 pounds. Get it off, you relieve the lymphatics, as we heard today, you take 50 pounds away. It's a huge difference. But I'm not a plastic surgeon, I love to hear the the answer to that. 
Well, I think it was a great last point that Eve brought up because I kind of struggle with that myself too. When you're doing lip, uh, lip edema surgery on extremities and you've got this large pan that's hanging over, compressing lymphatics and making the problem worse. So I think that's a really good point. Um, the quick answer to the question about the weight limit is, personally, I don't have a weight limit. Um, I've done patients up to 500 pounds. I did two patients last week, 460 and 420 or so. And um, I think ideally, sure, it would be great if patients could lose weight, but the reality is patients have usually been there, done that with it, and really can't lose the weight with it. And so we're the, you know, I feel like I'm the end of the line with, with patients, and I, I don't reject patients uh, almost never, and I take patients that are overweight and do them, uh, but I think you're, you're more careful about how you do them. I generally don't do those patients circumferentially, almost never, um, as, as, as in what I'll do in other patients. And many times I'll bring an anesthesiologist in, um, at least for monitoring on those patients that are more high risk with things. So um, uh, I, I'm actually going to answer two different questions. Uh, the first was with the, the size. And um, one of the things I mentioned earlier was I'm, I'm actually doing a fellowship with, as long as practicing with Dr. Amron. So I, I've seen the way he's treated hundreds of over thousands of patients now. And so, and he's done it safely and he's developed different techniques for each of them. And so I don't think we look at weight limit, but I do think we look at, we alter the techniques that we do together. So I, I think that's one thing. The second point that was brought up was, and that's, that was part of my, my talk today also was, you know, are there other te are there other things that we need to look at also? And, and the panis is is big. When, when I was first talking about even the lymphedema masses, if you ever seen someone with a 50 or 60 pound lymphedema mass hanging off their leg, I mean, you can't get around, and that's not you know it, you, you can't even get to the doctor. So the same thing when somebody has that hanging off their stomach, you know, this is something we should start looking at. When I was talking about the research component, that's one thing that Dr. Amber and I are starting to look at right now, and that is. Um, when do, when do these procedures happen? I mean, maybe some of them have to happen prior to even the, the um, you know, even pr prior to the lipidema surgeries. I mean, maybe that's what, the one thing we have to look at. Um, but I do think that's a great topic, and I, and I love that you brought that up. So thank you. I, I mean, I, I agree with what, every, uh, what everything that's been said so far. It's, again, it's a process. We want to find out what the patient's goals are. There's, there's not necessarily a set cutoff and limit, but again, keeping in mind that the heavier the patient is, that the more chance that they're going to have of a, a problem and there's certain things that you can no longer offer with, with someone getting really heavy. Uh, there's also questions of equipment and, and, um, and then safety. For example, going to sleep, if, if you're very heavy, it's going to be hard to wake that patient up with the general anesthetic. So how, so how do you address those things? Um, so again, I, I echo with it. It's going to be patient specific. There's not necessarily a limit, but certainly the, the lighter, the better. If there's an obesity component, again, it should be, that might need to be addressed separate from the, the lipedema. And um, like has also been mentioned right here, sometimes we have to see what we're doing. If, we, if those areas just on the medial knees are touching so much that they hurt so much that the patient can't get around, well, maybe small focal procedures to address those things could could be helpful first, but again, patient specific. Very, I'm sorry, Shine, very quickly. The very overweight patient usually, as we see and Polly mentioned, usually after lipidema surgery and you're doing two or three surgeries, removing leaders with your surgery, they then start to metabolically change their body and they then start to lose weight. So they're frustrated with things beforehand. They can't lose weight. It's, it's, it's difficult to expect them to, but after the lipidema surgery, over and over and over again, we see the weight tend to reduce in patients. Because the fat is hormonally responsive, but also hormonally active, too. Okay, final question, and then this will be, and I um, ask for a 10 second response. <laughs> I'm asking a lot of this group, aren't I? So the final question is, is there a, talk to us about your costs, and that's the burning, another burning question is, is what are your costs um, for liposuction for, um, for lipedema? Dr. Granza. Uh, Dr. Amron, go first. I'll just start. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a good question. I'm actually going to probably write a whole thing up about explaining costs and stuff like that. We all have different ways of charging for things. I think probably the fairest way is how long you're spending in the operating room and charging probably per hour of surgery. You're, you can either charge by body parts and add it up, or you can charge per surgery. Uh, personally, I tend to do things in two surgeries, most patients, I spend four to four and a half hours with each surgery, and I charge um, uh, commensurate with that. Do you want to know exact numbers? Or yes, is that please. 
<laughs> they want they they want a range. Uh. So 10 oh, seconds or less, okay. everybody, all right, give, so, your, give okay, your range. So, so, all right, very quickly. <laughs> I, I usually do circumferential thighs all the way around. It's about a three and a half to four hour operation. My surgical fee is 12,500 for that. My second common surgery is circumferential calves and ankles all the way down along with the upper arms and many times the forearms too. Also out of four operation with a vaser, sometimes laser too. My fee is also 12,000 for that. Dr. Shapira. Well, um, <clears throat> The vast majority of my patients are paid by the insurance company, so these patients don't pay a penny. Um, those that pay, um, we charge 7,500 per procedure. Um, if eventually the insurance uh, uh, pay us, then we reimburse uh, the fee to the patients. Okay. Dr. Wright, let's go on down. So um, I, I do a, a flat rate uh, for each uh, lipedema, and I, I stage that and do as much as I can, as much as can be safely done with the local anesthetic, because I, I, uh, I don't use general anesthesia, and, um, in, and it's $5,400, uh, $5, um, and um, that's it. I usually start at for an isolated area or a small zone around $5,000. It goes up to around 12 to 13 for an extensively large case. But you remember that most patients that that have um, uh, stage two and I mean stage two, well, two and three are going to need multiple surgeries. Okay, Dr. Granzel. Um, I should let my office deal with the cost, so, but it's going to be, it's going to be on the, I'm sure it's going to be on the range that, that's very commensurate with there, so I, I wish I could give a better answer. Okay. And Dr. Schwartz, I know. And uh, for me, as part of a, like a, a lipidema fellowship, we're actually, my fee, I don't know, I forget the exact name, but it's, a, it's like, it's 75% of what Dr. Amron charges or 60, it, it's, it's a lot cheaper, than, it's like cheaper than what Dr. Amron charges for doing as part of the fellowship program through the, through FDRS and through his thing. Right. Well, thank you to all of our liposuction speakers.